Hello, this is Jack Jackson. Today we're going to be talking about inverse relations. Inverse relations are a very important type of transformations where we start with the original relation and we get a new one. One very important idea in algebra is that we can do and undo. That is, we want to be able to work both forward and backward through um, nearly every concept and application we study. We literally want you to know algebra forwards and backwards. This leads us to the idea of an inverse relation. So recall that we defined a relation in terms of um, sets of ordered pairs. In fact, a relation was any set of ordered pairs. And so we're going to define an inverse relation in that same uh, vein. The inverse relation of a given relation is found by simply switching all the coordinates of the ordered pairs in the original relation. So remember that we looked at relations in many different ways and many different representations. And we're going to take uh, this now and look at relations, uh, inverse relations, in each of those different ways as well. So first of all, we can look at uh, tables, and you know what we're saying here. What the definition says is that first coordinates become second coordinates, and second coordinates become first coordinates. So if uh, we see that three two is on the original relation, then the point two three is on the inverse. If seven five is on the original relation then 5, 7 is in the, on the inverse, so right away we see that inverses come in pairs. Um, you have a, relation, a first relation, its inverse is a new relation, the inverse of the new relation is the original relation. So they just go back and forth there. So pretty simple idea, uh, just, just switch the coordinates. If we think of an arrow diagram, we just want to reverse the arrows. So the original relation is here, and the easiest way to get the inverse relation is switch the end of the arrows, uh, which way the arrows are pointing. Of course, uh, what do we call this set over here? This is the domain, and this one over here is the range. And so what happens to the domain and range of a relation in general when you do the inverse? Well, they're going to swap as well, because the domain remembers the set of all the first coordinates, or inputs, or x values if we use our um, generic letters. And the range is a set of all outputs, or y values are, are uh, second coordinates. And so since we're switching first and second coordinates, we're going to be switching the domain and range. Now, we can also think of it as a rule. Remember, we looked at relations this way. So um, if the relation is start somewhere and then take two steps forward to find your, your uh, position, then the inverse relation is to take two steps backwards. So it's exactly the opposite uh, thing. If the relation is add 2, the inverse would be subtract 2. Uh, if the inverse is multiply by 3, the in, uh, if the original relation is multiply by 3, the inverse is divide by 3. So uh, here's another one. The first coordinate is the mother of the second coordinate. Well, the inverse is the second coordinate is the mother of the first coordinate. We're just switching those. We're switching the role of input and output. If the original function takes a day as the input and gives the high temperature as the output, then the inverse relation reverses this by taking the high temperature as the input and gives the day as the output. So we're just reversing that, okay? And so we're going. That's where that's where I say we're going backwards, okay? So we're reversing input and output. So if you think of a factory or a machine or a process by which we transform a first coordinate into a second coordinate, then, uh, then what we have here is the opposite process. And is the, notice it's the opposite steps in the opposite order. So let's take an assembly line process. Okay, we start with our raw materials, and then the first worker attaches part. Let's say they let's say they uh, snap part A to part B, and then the second worker. Um, screws on part C to part B. And then finally the third worker packages the assembly in a box. Well what would be the inverse of that? Where do you have to start? Well you start with the packaged up item, packaged up assembly. First you have to get it out of the box so you could give it back to the third worker and say undo what you did which is uh, pack it in the box and he's going to unpack it from the box. Then it goes back to the second worker. Instead of screwing on part C, he's going to now unscrew part C. Uh, 
and then finally it goes back to the first worker and instead of attaching part A, say snapping it on, he's going to unsnap it or unattach it. Okay, so notice it's the opposite steps in the opposite order. Everybody undoes their own step, but you start at the opposite end and work your back way backwards. Okay, so here's one with just more like uh, some basic number formulas here. If the relation is to add 1 and then multiply by 2, then the inverse is to do the opposite steps in opposite order. The last step originally was to multiply by 2, so the first step now on the inverse is divide by 2. The original step on the first one was to add 1, so the last step on the inverse is going to be sub to subtract 1. If we write that in formulas, uh, the original relation says you do x plus 1 in parentheses first, then multiply by 2, and that equals y. The inverse says you first divide by x by 2, then subtract 1, and that's y. And so you can see the two formulas there. How about another one? Giving directions. Notice that if you understand the idea of inverse relations, you shouldn't have to be able to give the directions or formula for the inverse relation. You could, but you can figure it out. For example, if someone gives you directions from, um, say, say school, say from, say from home to, to school for a certain person, they should be able to turn around and get from the school back home with the same set of original directions because they can just find the inverse. So, uh, for example, directions to go from home to school might be turn left, which is east, out of the driveway at home, and go five miles east. Then turn right, which is south at the traffic signal, go four miles south. Then turn right, which would be west, into the parking lot at school. And so those are directions to get from this person's home to this person's school. Well, if you know that, you shouldn't have to write down the inverse relation. You shouldn't have to write down directions home, or, or you can figure out there were directions home, I should say, because it's just the inverse relation. We're starting at school in the parking lot, so instead of turning right toward the west into the parking lot at school, we're going to turn um, turn left out of the parking lot at school. So now, instead of going, uh, originally we part D, we went four miles south, now we're going to go four miles north. Then we turn left, which is west, at the traffic signal, whereas originally we turned right, it's the opposite. Okay, then we're going to go five miles to the west, where originally we went five miles to the east. And we're going to end by turning right into the driveway at home, where originally we turned left out of the driveway at home. And so notice that there, again, it's the opposite steps in the opposite order. So, uh, as a formula or equation, it's a really simple thing to do. Uh, we've been looking at these transformations where we say replace blank by blank. Well, in this case, we just replace x by y, and we replace y by x. So everywhere the original relation has a y, we put an x, and everywhere the original one has an x, we put a y. Of course, I'm just using the generic letters for input and output, x for input, y for output. Remember, we're switching the order pair. So whatever your letters are for input and output, we just reverse them. Okay? So if the original relation is y equals x cubed, the inverse is x equals y cubed. If the original is y equals x squared, the inverse is x equals y squared. If the original is y equals 2x minus 7, the inverse is x equals 2y minus 7. If the original is y equals 2 to the x, then the inverse is x equals 2 to the y. If the original is x over 4 squared plus y over 5 squared equals 1, the inverse is y over 4 squared plus x over 5 squared equals 1. Now, Oftentimes, we like to have our relations solve for y if possible, and if it's a function, of course, we, can, we should be able to do that. So, um, I've also solved them for y in some of the cases here on the right. So, when we looked at part a, the inverse relation of y equals x cubed was x equals y cubed, and we can solve that for y by taking the cube root or one-third power of both sides. Since it's an odd root and an odd power there, uh, there's no absolute value or plus or minus, so we can solve for y in a single equation, and we get y equals x to the one-third, or x is the cube root.
So notice again, the cube root or one third power is exactly the opposite of cubing. So this agrees with our earlier interpretation as well. Now we have x equals y squared. When we take the square root or the one half power on both sides, now we have a bit of a problem because uh, when you take an even root of, a, of an even power, you have to introduce an absolute value uh, on the y, which turns out to be a plus or minus when you get rid of the absolute value. So <clears throat> this is in two equations, y equals the principal square root of x, the positive square root of x, and then y is also the opposite of that. So we get plus or minus the square root of x. But that's not one equation, that's two equations. So that's not truly solve for y in a single equation. So we know that x equals y squared is not uh, y, y is not a function of x there. Uh, that graph will not pass the vertical line test, just like the original one would, would not pass the horizontal line test. Moving on, uh, the next one is linear, so we can easily solve that for y. Uh, I like this slope x-intercept form better in a way because you can see the opposite steps in the opposite order better there. So notice you just switch x and y. So writing it as x equals 2y minus 7 is probably the clearest way to see that all we did is we just switch x and y. If we also solve for y, we would add 7 to both sides, then multiply by half. And if you leave it in that factored form, that slope x-intercept form, the factored form, y equals 1 half times parentheses x plus 7, then you can clearly see that, the, that it's the opposite steps in the opposite order because it's first add 7, then uh, divide by 2, whereas the original was first multiply by 2 and then subtract 7. So it's opposite steps in the opposite order. Of course, we have looked at several other forms of linear equations, and the, probably the most common one, most standard one, is to put it in slope, what's called slope-intercept or slope-y-intercept form, and that is just distribute the 1 half when we get y equals 1 half x plus 7 halves. But either way you write it, it's, it's still the inverse relation. We'll learn later on how to take the 1 in part d and solve that for y, and I'm not going to uh, bother doing the 1 for e. So now what does this do to us graphically? One of the things that we've been doing lately has been looking at, at uh, different transformations of graphs and seeing, well, what if we make a change in the formula? What does that do to the graph? So what happens to the graph of the relation if we switch x and y? Well, let's take an example. Let's take these same uh, five examples, a, b, c, d, and e, and graph both of these pairs and look at what happens on the graph. Well, I've also graphed the, uh, the little kind of aqua color line there is the um, line y equals x. And notice the points on the line y equals x will not change because remember we're switching the order pairs. So if 2, 3 is on the original relation, 3, 2 is going to be on the new, re new relation, the inverse relation, those are going to be different points. But if you take something like 1, 1, and you switch it, it's still 1, 1. That's a fixed point of this transformation. So it doesn't change. And it turns out, I'll actually prove this in just a minute, but it turns out that, I think you can see on these graphs, that you end up getting a, uh, the inverse relation is actually a reflection of the original relation over the line y equals x. So this is another reflection here and you can see that in all the cases so I have all of these uh, graphed here and in every time it's a the inverse is uh, flipped over the line y equals x from the original. We can actually prove that what does it mean to be uh, a reflection? If you look down here at the picture you can see it. You start with the point AB here and the inverse is the point BA down here. Well, for it to be a reflection over this line, that geometrically that means if you connect those two with a, per, with a um, line segment, then the mirror line needs to be a perpendicular bisector of that. Well, that means this is a right angle right here where they meet, and it means that the distance from AB to the line is the same as it is from BA to the line. So we can, we can do that. That means that this point here on the intersection point is actually the midpoint. So what we're saying is the midpoint has to be on the line where A equals B. So we've got our two points, A, B, and B, A. Well, we know a midpoint formula. It's X1 plus X2 over 2 and Y1 plus Y2 over 2. And X1 is A, 
y1 is b, x2 is b, and x and y2 is a. So I plug those in, and we get this here, but a, b plus a is a plus b, and so now we see that this point is a point with the same x and y coordinates. So that's on this set of points, x, y, such that y equals x, which is this line right here. So we do know the midpoint's on there. Now the next question is to see if the... Uh, if they're perpendicular. Okay. Well, remember we can we know something about perpendicular lines and slopes. Okay. So let's find the slope of this line segment here. And if you notice, look at them. They're all parallel. So they're all going to be the same slope. And we're going to prove that here. So the slope is delta y over delta x. That's y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Plug in the, the values we have. That's a minus b over b minus a. B minus A is negative 1. Well, it's negative A plus B, then factor out a negative 1. So it's negative 1 times A minus B. And notice the A minus B's cancel. You get 1 over negative 1 is negative 1. So all of these little line segments connecting up pre-image to image point are, uh, have a slope of negative 1. But the line Y equals X is a line with slope 1. Well, if you have slopes that are opposite reciprocals, then those lines uh, are per perpendicular. In other words, if you multiply the two slopes to get negative 1, then you've got perpendicular lines, and that's certainly what we have here. So this actually proves that, uh, that this idea of switching the AB uh, a, to BA gives you uh, a mirror image over the line Y equals X, which certainly you can, can visually see. All right, now, I want to talk about a little bit of terminology here. Notice that every relation has an inverse relation. So, which relations are invertible? Well, in the sense that every relation has, a, has an inverse relation, the answer should be all of them are. And it is that, that is the answer. All relations are invertible. They have inverses, which are relations. Some textbooks use a terminology which I find unfortunate, and they talk about which are invertible functions. And by that, they don't mean which functions have inverses, because again, all functions have inverses. What they mean is which functions have inverses which are also functions. So they're talking about the class of relations so that both the inverse and the original are functions. Okay, so certainly they're functions, but it's more special than that. Okay, so let's think about this. If the original is a function, it says there are no repeats in the first coordinates. But since the inverse is switching the x and y's, first coordinates and second coordinates, then that says that there are no repeats in the second coordinate of the inverse. So, if the first original function has no repeats in the first coordinates, then the second one has, the, the inverse has no repeats in the second coordinate. If the inverse has no repeats in the first coordinate, meaning that it's a function, then the original has no repeats in the, in the uh, second coordinate. So if they're both functions, that means they both have no repeats in the first coordinate, but that means their inverses, both of them, have no repeats in the second coordinate. So that means uh, we've studied these kinds before. These are exactly what we call one-to-one -one functions. So graphically, uh, we can also say it this way. When you take a vertical line and flip it over the line y equals x, you get a horizontal line. And so if the original one passes the vertical line test on the graph, then the inverse passes the horizontal line test and vice versa. So if they're both going to pass the vertical line test, they both have to pass the horizontal line test. So which functions have inverses that are also functions, and the answer to that is only the one-to-one -one functions. And some people that, when they say which are the invertible functions, they, that's what they're talking about. Which functions have inverses are also functions. I personally don't like that terminology, but sometimes you'll encounter that. So, if we kind of approach this like we've done before, with some examples uh, and look at a table and a graph. What we're doing in the formula is switching x and y. What we end up doing on the graph is reflect about the line y equals x. And so you can see here some examples. 
uh, start again using our, our examples we've been using a lot, y equals x squared and y equals x cubed. And so you can see it here at the point level where I've taken, uh, made some points for y equals x squared. And here I've lined it up uh, pre-image to image. So again, if I do this, and um, line these up. These are lined up in such a way that we have pre-image to image lined up. And so these are on the same same line of the table and all we're doing is switching the uh, ordered pairs. So negative 3, 9 becomes 3, or 9, negative 3. Or over here 2, 8 becomes 8, 2. And you can see it again on the graph. It's just reflecting over the line y equals x. So here's some exercises in these notes, and I'll let you uh, work through those yourself. Which of these, uh, see if you can start with the table and then come up with the table for the inverse. So I'll, I'll do the first part here. If this has 2, 6, then what's this one going to have? Well, 6, 2. And I'll leave it to you to finish those. And it asks you which are both functions. Okay, here we have a graph. And how would we graph the inverse? Now, we could do this a couple ways. If we could figure out the formula for this graph, we could do it by reversing the formula and using software to graph it. We can also do it by hand, by um, plotting some points. Uh, notice that's 0, 0. That's going to be fixed. This is the point. looks like 1, 3. So the inverse is going to have uh, 3, 1. We could put a dot there and so forth. And we could we could uh, reverse a few points and then connect the dots to to uh, graph those. Okay, like I said again, if you know the uh, formula or can figure out the formula, then uh, then you can also just do it by reverse switching x and y and then graphing that. Okay, you can also graph. You should if you do this on a piece of actual paper, you should also be able to take this and draw in the line y equals x, fold the paper along the line y equals x, and look through the paper, and what you should see through the paper, um, you can trace it on forwards and on the back side, and then again through on the front side, and that will be your inverse relation, or you can check what you've done by graphing another method by making sure that those match up whenever you fold along that line. Here are some exercises that you can uh, do. And here, um, I think the easiest way to do is think of this in terms of opposite steps in the opposite order. Okay, let's look through this example here. I'm going to leave those exercises for you to do on your own. So find the inverse of the function uh, f of x equals 2x cubed minus 4 over 5. So f of x is another way of just saying f or y. So I'm just going to write that as y for a moment. And so I've got y equals 2x cubed minus 4 over 5. That's the original one. That's in blue. And black is going to be the inverse relation. And to find the inverse relation, we switch x and y. We could solve the original relation any way we want, and it's still the original relation until we switch the x and y values. Once we switch x and y, whatever point we do that, that's when it becomes the inverse relation because that's when we're switching the, the role of input-output. So here we switch x and y, now it becomes the inverse relation, x equals 2y cubed minus 4 over 5. But when possible, we like to solve for y. So let's go through those steps. Uh, the first thing we need to do, first thing we need to undo is the last thing that was done on the right side. So the right side, notice you first cube, then you multiply by 2, then you subtract 4, then you divide by 5. So we want to, in solving the equation, solving equations really is basically applying the inverse relation because we want to we again undo things by doing the opposite steps in the opposite order so we want to undo the divide by 5 by multiplying both sides of the equation by 5 that gets us to 5x equals 2y cubed minus 4 then the last step now on the right is subtract 4 so we undo that by adding 4 to both sides that gives us 5x plus 4 equals 2y cubed on the right side the last thing that you would do here is multiply by 2 now. So now we divide by 2 on both sides to undo that. 
then the only step left on the right side is cubing, so we undo that by uh, one-third power or a cube root. I wrote it as a cube root this time. Now, being an odd power and odd root that match, they just cancel out. No absolute value, no plus or minus, just y on the right side. And so now we have it. y is the cube root of 5x plus 4 over 2 uh, with the right grouping that you see there in, the, uh, in that graphic. Okay, let me make this, let me actually make this a little bit bigger. A little bit more, let me make it, um, make this a little bit easier to see if I make this bigger. Probably should have done that earlier, sorry about that. There we go, now we can see that a little bit better. Now, our original relation we called it f of x. Now notice since we were able to solve for y here, this is a function. So we could call it f of x or g of x or h of x or something like that. But we really don't want to call it f of x because f of x is our original relation, so we don't want to call it that. Uh, so we might want to pick a different letter, g of x or something. But on the other hand, this one was based on that original relation. It's the inverse of that original function f. So what we're going to actually do is we're going to use a notation like this. Instead, of, we're going to replace the y with the symbol f inverse of x, and that's f superscript negative 1. It is not a power. So this does not mean reciprocal. I mean, if you look over here on the right, you notice it's not just the reciprocal of what we started with. It's not a negative 1 power, but it does mean what? The inverse function, the inverse relation, and it is the opposite steps in the opposite order. And of course, we only use this f of x kind of notation when there have functions. So if f of x is a function and f inverse is a function, then you would use this notation. Okay. Now, another way to do this same problem, or a way to check it, is to do it this way. Think of a little flow chart here, where our original function, if you break it down into steps, it said first we cube, then we multiply by 2, then we subtract 4, and then we divide by 5. If you look back at the original function, the original formula, that's exactly what it does. In fact, you know what, let me pull that, let me make the copy of that, and bring that down here. Oh, didn't work. There it is. So there's the there's the original. Okay. And then the inverse was here. So here I'm doing it as a sort of as a check. Okay. Okay, so the, see the formula? First you cube, then you multiply by 2, then you subtract 4, then you divide by 5. So what's the inverse? It's the opposite steps in the opposite order. So instead of the last step here is divide by 5, so the first step here is multiply by 5, which is the first thing we do here. The next to the last step is subtract 4, so the next to the first step, the second step, is to add 4. So after we multiply by 5, we add 4. The next step here, working backwards, is multiply by 2. So the next step here, working forwards, is divide by 2. And the first step in the original is cubing, so the last step in the inverse is cube root. So you could have done actually found this this way, actually written out the steps here, reversed them, and then written out a formula based on this. Take your input, x, multiply by 5, that's 5x, add 4, that's plus 4, Take that whole thing and divide by 2. If you use a horizontal fraction line, that groups it. You might want to put parentheses around the numerator. It's not necessary, but, it's possible, but it might be helpful. And then, last step, cube root of the whole thing. And call that f inverse of x. So here are some examples and exercises for you to try. And again, I'm going to leave those as, as a homework set. Okay, so there you go. You have uh, these notes will be posted. And you also have um, 
this overview of inverse relations. So of all the transformations we're doing, actually inverse relations are the most important because this idea that we can we can uh, find the inverse relation says if we know how to go forward, now we can go backwards. And if it's a if it's a one to one function, then it's very explicit going forwards and backwards because there are no steps, uh, no choices uh, other than the one choice, no multiple choices in either direction. And so, uh, knowing an input gives you exactly one output, and every output comes from one input. So reversing would be a function as well. Uh, but even if it's not a function, if one's a function and the other and the inverse is not, like if the, if the original function's a function but not one to one, then the inverse will be a relation that's not a function. But we could also have examples where there are neither one func functions, but we can have some that are both. So this inverse relation is a pretty important idea.